that of open source. And at some level, why you say why why do I say free software rather than open exactly. source? Exactly. So a little bit more about that. I mean, you, you well, you know, these are just two sets of words, right? Open source and free software. The, the words themselves are not important. What's important is the huge body of sort of semantic opinion that that, that underlies those. And, and you have two camps. You know, the, the open source camp evolved fundamentally as a way to get companies, corporations, comfortable enough with free software that they would want to be associated with it publicly, that they would want to be users of it, create dependencies of themselves on it, and also to publish their own work under it. And so the, a lot of the stuff that is open source as opposed to free software is all about various compromises and trade-offs, trying to find a balance that will, that will appease and, 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 and appeal to corporates. And to a certain extent, I think that's very important, right? Corporate investment and backing and encouragement ha has been enormously important to the growth of the free software and open source phenomenon, right? It just, we, we, we would still be a f completely a fringe environment unless IBM, HP, Intel, uh, uh, Sun and others really started to, 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 to say to the world that this is a healthy and natural part of the IT landscape, right? So I think that's good. But when I look at the driving forces of innovation, you know, particularly innovation, and the driving forces of, of the broader ecosystem right, that actually makes free software the, the wonderful thing that it is, the people who put that effort in are not motivated by the things that the open source group speaks to. They're motivated and inspired by the things that motivate and inspire me, which is the empowerment of this, the fact that it comes with rights attached to it, the fact that it comes with the ability to, to make it better for you, right? that you become an, a central part of the process. And I think that's true not only for um, the people who are software developers, because you never know how you're actually going to become a contributor to the free software process, right? If you look at the, the meme, the idea of participation, that is spreading now to all sorts of other aspects, right? To you know, look at Wikipedia, the classic example of reference text being created in a participatory kind of way. I think we'll see all sorts of other forms of media, television media, radio media, and so on, podcasting, being democratized and, and, and having the same freedom, set of freedoms come to the, come to the fore and, and participation coming to the fore. So, so I think this is, th th that, that, that set of ideas is actually the more important set of ideas. I recognize the importance of the things that the open source guys are trying to do. I appreciate what that does for all of us. But if you really want to know what lights the fire, it's the freedoms, not the ability to see the source code. There are a lot of very smart geeks who wouldn't fit into Ubuntu or Canonical. So what we look for is, in other words, I guess what I'm saying is I don't think I'm authoritative on geeks universally, because I actually only work with a very small subset of guys that you would call geeks. And those are geeks who have very strong set of values around free software and, 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 and the freedoms associated with free software. There are a lot of very smart, bright guys out there who are just not interested in that stuff. They want to work with hot technology, interesting technology, and complicated problems and stuff like that. They don't care if it's available to a universal audience or not. And um, so, because I don't really connect with them, you know, they end up working for the NSA or Google or, or you know, Microsoft. Right? They're smart, nice, good, good guys. I have fun when I connect with them. But they're not, peop they're not people who would fit into our kind of community. So I won't really try and speak to them. Right? They'll have to speak for themselves. You'll have to find someone else to talk for them. The, as the idea started to crystallize in my head about building something, taking free software to the desktop right, in a way that was genuinely free, I was trying to figure out the smartest way to do this. And by smart, I mean the th you know, basically getting the most done for the least amount of pain or money. Right? And so one of the options that I had was basically to inject the funds that I wanted and, the, and my personal energy into, into an existing project. I looked at a bunch of the different free software projects. Um, I've had a long history with Debian, right? It goes back to the, to the mid-90s where I was a, a started maintaining packages and so on because Debian seemed like the system, the Debian system seemed like the, the sanest and most sensible to me, right? The, 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 the ideas that were introduced of independence between maintainers, each doing their own thing, but, but 
effectively collaborating through a sort of fairly standard set of processes. That seemed to me the right way to do things right, in any project. And so it, it turned out that when I looked at it again, that was still the case, that this was still you know, the, 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 the community that, that had the best balance between um, cohesion and independence. Um, and so I looked for a while at trying to do what, what we do inside the Debian community. And it struck me just that what we would be doing effectively would, would, would create tremendous divides if I try to do it inside the community. Because essentially what I was trying to do is saying, I care a lot about this specific set of use cases. And the wonderful thing about Debian is that it, it doesn't ever do that, right? It says, in fact, we must embrace and reach out and become a kind of a use, universal environment. So I realized that if I came in and tried to sort of do this within, within Debian, um, while I could probably succeed, it would take something away from Debian, right? It would essentially narrow its scope, <laughs> narrow its focus, narrow the number of architectures, narrow the number of use cases which are considered important, which would make it better for those use cases, but it would actually take away what is the essential value of the thing, right? It would be a little bit like trying to get people who work on the kernel only to focus on, like the kernel.org guys, only to focus on two architectures and one sort of use case, right? You would reduce the value of Linux for running on mainframes, for running on you know, big database servers, for running on watches and PDAs and all of that kind of stuff. And that would be the wrong thing to do. So I realized that what we needed to do was to, 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 to create something which would, which would essentially, if you think of the Debian system effectively as being this huge family that reaches out from people who've taken Debian into, into you know, PDAs and people who've taken it to mainframes, right? That we wanted to create another branch of that, essentially, all underneath the same umbrella. Um, and so, yeah, I, needed, I knew that I needed to find good people. And um, I did download not the whole Debian mailing list archive, but over the previous sort of year and a half, uh, probably about 30 mailing lists, 30 of the major mailing lists um, that touched on the things that I thought were important. And then read through those, trying to find threads, ideas, people, you know, people who express the same kind of vision, people who express the same kind of um, approach, priorities, values uh, that I had. And that became the core of, of the Ubuntu team. And there are some things that, I, you know, that Debian is always going to do better than Ubuntu, right? So we must, we must make, do everything that we can to make sure that that stuff lands on Debian's plate and that we, to the extent that we can facilitate that, that we absolutely do. There are some things that Ubuntu is always going to do better than Debian, right? And so we just make sure that we focus on those things, do those things really well, and make sure that to the extent that Debian wants that contribution, it can take that contribution, right? That it's, that it's there on a platter, nicely served up, easy to take. So absolutely, I think that it's just a matter of time. This community is going to be producing the software that the world runs in, whether it's five years' time or 10 years' time or 20 years' time, I don't really mind. This process, the processes that we employ, are going to win. They're better processes. I, I do believe that, right? If your people are better and your processes are better, the world adopts what you do. As momentum for free software grows, that that, that ground will go entirely over to, to free software because, again, it comes back to this difference between open source and free. It's not just being free beer, it's not just being free of charge, right? Even if Microsoft gives their software f away free of charge, they're only giving away functionality points. They're not creating an empowering environment. And remember, they can only give away the software that they have. So when I look at a school that's deployed free software, right, for the artists in the school, we've got rich art software. Microsoft doesn't have rich art software. They don't have a Photoshop, right? They they're hoping to create one, but they don't have one. They can't give one away. Um, when I look at people who are interested in astronomy, right, there's tons of free software for astronomy. But Microsoft doesn't have astronomy software to give away. And when I, when I see people who are interested in linguistics and statistics and programming and so on, Microsoft only has a certain amount of stuff that they can give away. So from a holistic ecosystem point of view, the free software platform is just that much richer, that much more empowering that I think uh, it, it, it's going to win in the education space. As free software becomes more widely used, we get to help define what computing is all about for millions and millions of people. And that's exciting, right? I think Steve Jobs loves that, right? He gets up and he says, oh, what amazing things are people going to do with technology and with computers, right? And where I would differ is in the way the stuff is licensed and how people get to use it if they don't want to pay for it and that sort of thing. So there are philosophical differences between us, but we still get excited about, I think, the same thing, which is, geez, what should my experience of this computer thing be like? 
So, uh, so there's, there's that. It's a multifaceted love affair.